Our speaker is Huma Shah from Coventry University, and my name is Carmen McWilliams, and I'm the moderator and organizer and the director of the company Grassroots Arts and partner in the current European AI project. Please take notice that the session will be recorded. The recording of this live web session will be available afterwards on the request and on our AI for You platform. Please don't share any confidential information in this cafe, it is public. And in this cafe, the speakers express their personal view and opinions. This is not necessarily the official AI for You project opinion. And now, again, for all the newcomers, what is the AI for You cafe about? You're still waiting for all the participants coming in, so. Relax. The Web Cafe offers a series of live web sessions open to the public. The Cafe is an online forum to gain insights into the European AI theme. Participants get the chance to share knowledge and experiences and meet stakeholders from various areas of AI, research and application. Huma will soon make her presentation. Please afterwards ask your questions to the speaker in the question panel. You can, during the presentation, already write them into the questions. There's a, like a function on the right side called questions. You can write in, and after the presentation, I will read them loud to everybody, and whom I will hopefully answer it. You may also raise your hand. There's a button for hand rising, uh, and after the presentation, you get the microphone. So now I want to welcome Huma. Maybe you are there, Huma? Yes. yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> nice to hear you. And I will introduce you to everybody. She is the Director of Science of a European Horizon 2020 project, research project. It's called CSI COP. In long, the long name is Citizen Scientist Investigating Cookies and Apps GDPR Compliance. And she also is the member, associate, associate member of Data Science Research Center. She's an assistant professor, trust in AI, School of Computing, Electronics and Mathematics, Faculty of Engineering, Environment and Computing. She co authored the book. Turing's Imitation Game, Conversations with the Unknown, published by Cambridge University Press. She also is lead author and co-led over 30 peer-reviewed publications. She collaborated with the pan-European team on the European FP7 funded Bobo Law project. She coordinated public AI events at UCL, Reading University, Bletchley Park and Royal Society London. And as science and technology ambassador, she took part in I'm a scientist, get me out of here in November 2006, answering pupils' questions in a school engagement event funded by the Wellcome Trust. The aim of, my, of her participation was to encourage interest in AI and robotics, particularly by female pupils in higher education. That's really interesting, and her research focus examines fundamental artificial intelligence and trust in artificial intelligence applications. So this is pretty interesting, and I will now hand over the control to you, Homer, and you can make your presentation. For this, I first have to give you the control. So as always, we have to wait a moment. Thank you. You will now get it. Huma, you have it now. And now you can start your presentation. If Thank you. I will tell you. Um, I see it. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay. Cool. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, oh, just um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I'm just going to talk about um, are, are AI teams not diverse enough, but are we thinking that diverse teams would be the panacea for the current situations and problems that we see? Not necessarily. Um, it's just to open a discussion about uh, 
AI teams uh, in research and development. So I hope you will bear with me. Um, so yes, um, uh, Carmen has already. Sorry. Huma, may you just? I'm now still on the screen. Maybe you want to show your face just once. Uh, yes. So is my screen being shared? Your PowerPoint is shared, but we don't see you. Okay. So how do I also share my? There's a camera uh, sign. A camera. Yes. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry, people. Sorry about that. I'll get used to this uh, webinar. Okay, so good afternoon again. So I'll just quickly move beyond this slide, which already uh, 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 Carmen explained. Um, uh, can you see my screen with the box at the side? Carmen, how do I um, reduce the box, which is the webinar box? You don't have to. That... You don't have to. Oh. You're fine. We only okay. see your presentation. Okay. And right. Okay. You're perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I want to um, show you these images. All I did was do a search for uh, human robot and human machine interaction. So as you can see my screen, um, these are the images um, that uh, that came up. So I'm not going to state the obvious of, uh, uh, of what this is, but so I'm going to jump straight into the marketing strategies uh, of artificial intelligence. So um, Sorry, why am I not able to? Yeah, okay. So um, this is um, a, a slide that I saw. And if you have a look, um, artificial intelligence, um, it's been described as a marketing term. So artificial intelligence to this particular whoever it was uh, is not a science, it's a marketing term. Um, here's something else. Um, about AI that I saw on Twitter, still wondering how to implement AI faster. So here we have an example of some kind of AI being magic and that implementing artificial intelligence more speedily with alacrity could unlock uh, data. So again, this is marketing, which I think is misrepresenting uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, now, I live in London, and uh, this is something that I saw inside a tube, uh, uh, the tube going from uh, Euston to uh, where I live, Harrow on the Hill. Ma, and uh, if you can see... Because we don't see your slides. Um, we only see my activities include science director. We don't see the next slide. I think you want to share with us slides. Right. Okay. So why am I not sharing? Um, yes. Okay. So now, other slides... Yes. Now we see right, now you... press better. Perfect. Okay, so um, so let me just go back to from current slide. So did you see um, all apologies for that technical skills? So did you see this slide? Oh, no. Uh, and... no. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, you see now all the changing slides, but we didn't see. Ah before okay apologies for that okay so this is the slide um um that uh, describes artificial intelligence as you can see is a marketing term okay so this is uh, the slide that's um describing um how possibly come and see this this uh, the video at a conference and they will show you how to implement ai faster again this is marketing ploys as if artificial intelligence is some kind of magic to unlock data and not the very hard science that it actually is. So this is what I was talking about. This was uh, uh, on the tube. Can you all see this? Yes. It's a, a poster on the tube. If you see, it says, we combine expert stylists with clever AI. What does it mean by clever AI? Again, this is marketing the term and it's kind of misrepresenting the term. So are other AIs dumb? That this one is a clever one? That it helps you to style your clothes to your uh, size and budget? Again, to me, this is misusing the term of artificial intelligence. And it reminds me of Drew McDermott's article, Artificial Intelligence Meets Natural Stupidity. So apologies for inserting that there, but this is what comes to mind when I see it, a lot of these marketing ads about what artificial intelligence uh, can do and what is promised. Um, 
so coming back to being serious, the I in AI represents intelligence. So we know that the origins of artificial intelligence emerged from John McCarthy's term, the coining of it in 1955, and as a science in 1956. Uh, this is, I, I show this to my students to let them know that Google did not invent AI, that it's been around for a hell of a lot longer than Google. <coughs> and it followed from the scholarship of Alan Turing um, following his work at Bletchley Park uh, during the Second World War. What Alan Turing said about intelligence and his 1948 essay, Intelligent Machinery, is now considered the first manifesto of artificial intelligence. The most visual representation, as he was describing it, would be an embodied thinking machine. So an artificial intellect, intellect as we could visualize it, would be something that would be embodied. So where do we see these kinds of embodied AIs? Well, here's one which is a, in a Kyoto um, temple, which is tr uh, a robot uh, Buddhist, uh, that is the temple are trying to persuade more people back into temples, into Buddhism. So it would be interesting for people to go there to see what this robot says. Whether it's an AI or not is another issue. So smart machines and algorithms, of course, we have examples of them. For example, 2011, IBM's Watson machine uh, took part in a reverse question answer uh, a TV general knowledge quiz show and beat the two reigning human champions in 2016. We know AlphaGo beat uh, Leo Sadol in the uh, mind uh, game. Open AI's project are doing very interesting things. One of their projects, <clears throat> uh, was a virtual hide and seek uh, game with virtual assistants, virtual uh, players, and the virtual players would be were able to go on to, uh, what they were programmed to do, and to simulate hide and seek environments, and do things that they were not programmed to do. So we know that we can build intelligent systems that go on what they're programmed to do. Then there's the Lerbner Prize winning chatbot. Uh, if you've actually chatted to it, I think you will hopefully accept that it's not very intelligent. Uh, Google have just brought out their MENA chatbot. Nobody's actually talked to it. They've just released a paper on the MENA chatbot. But oh, the, these kind of systems are really popular, especially in e-commerce, to try and engage uh, customers and consumers to uh, use the chatbots instead of the frequently asked questions to persuade people to buy purchase more. So what is intelligence? If we're trying to build AI, there's all this marketing about AI, and it's missing the point that the I represents intelligence. What is it? So Turing said, idea of intelligence, the idea of it is not mathematical. It's an emotional concept. So he's trying. he was trying to say that you can't really measure it because it's when we attribute intelligence to somebody, it's based on our subjective opinion of what intelligence is. What Turing's view was that the extent to which we regard something as behaving in an intelligent manner is determined as much by our own state of mind and training as by the properties of the object under consideration. In other words, it is a subject, a subjective measure when we regard something as being intelligent. What he said about simulating the human mind and programming a machine to think, he said the process should bear a close relation to that of teaching. I hope I'm not going too fast. Please slow me down if you think I am. Um, and what Turing went on to say, which are that his words, I feel, and his uh, ideas are very relevant today, that the pursuit of building thinking machines would help us greatly would help us humans greatly in finding out how we think ourselves. What Turing said, and it, it shows in um, the intelligence tests and how they've been used, that intelligence tests to test humans are not based on any very sound scientific principles. So the testing of intelligence in humans is not very scientific. And not a great deal of agreement is there amongst the different experts regarding the 
nature of intelligence. It depends what perspective you're taking, whether it's biological, uh, computational, psychological. It depends what perspective you are coming at when you're uh, uh, looking at the nature of intelligence. Now, there is an information processing view of intelligence, which is applicable to machines and robots. This is Joseph Fagan's view uh, that it's all about access to opportunity to enter the world of knowledge. So really what Joseph Fagan is saying is you cannot compare two entities unless they really have had the same access to the same opportunities to gain knowledge. And this is uh, very applicable to artificial intelligence. So what Fagan is saying is consider the implications for society of defining intelligence as processing. The controversy surrounding the term intelligence has arisen and continues because intelligence has historically been defined as how much someone knows rather than how well, process, how well one processes. Now think about that. If tests are defining how much you know, but people who are being tested have not been have not had the opportunity to access that knowledge before they're tested, that's not a, ver a very fair test of intelligence. Rather, how they process the knowledge they've acquired is a better examination. So what Fagan is saying is that IQ scores by convention are based on how much somebody knows relative to somebody of their own age. But that doesn't answer the question, has somebody the same age, uh, have they had the same access to the same information? Have they had access to the opportunities to gain the same knowledge? So what Fagan is saying is intelligence is processing and that processing can be measured by performance on certain elementary cognitive tasks. So an IQ score, on the other hand, that depends on not only on processing ability, but on what one has been taught. So the IQ scores are not really a fair assessment. What Fagan is saying is information is processed, it changes the mind. The mind that changes, it changes through knowledge, acquiring knowledge. And how do we convey our knowledge? Through communication, verbal, nonverbal. Through humans, our language is a set of vocal or written signs and symbols that allow us as a social group to talk to each other and that facilitates our thinking and the actions of different people. And this is a, a quote from Fischler and Fershine in 1987. Language in the full sense of the term is species specific to human. This is not saying that animals and other species don't have communication. But when we talk about language, which is like verbal and written signs and gestures, that is species specific to human. That's not saying we're more intelligent than uh, animal kingdom. What the difference is that humans are constantly changing their world, whereas animals live the same way as they always have. So what Turing said on language is that the learning of languages is an impressive human activity. So for him, out of all the activities that humans take part in, he considered the learning of languages as the most impressive of human activities. So his intelligence examination, whatever you want to call it, imitation game or test, he explored intelligent machinery through its ability to think. Now, for Turing, what exactly is thinking? Turing said it's a sort of buzzing in his head. What he did quite cleverly, he avoided definitions. He did not define intelligence, nor did he define machine intelligence. And you can understand why. And Plato um, showed this in his Larchie's dialogue through generals talking to the Socrates character, asking the Socrates character, Socrates, where should we send our sons to school? Should it be a normal school or a military school? Through that discussion in Larches, Socrates draws out what exactly do the generals want their boys to learn? What knowledge, what skills do they want the, the boys to learn? And 
through that dialogue you understand that if you want your children to become courageous, what exactly is courageous? When you give instances of courageousness, they might seem like actions that could be considered foolhardy. For example, if you accidentally um, die while saving somebody's life, not only could that be courageous, but it also could be foolhardy. So what's happening is you're using words to define words that need defining themselves. So you're getting a circular argument, which was also demonstrated by Quine. So Turing realizing this did not define intelligence. He did not define machine intelligence. What he did was he proposed a practical way to assess intelligence through what is now popularly, popularly known as the imitation game or the Turing test. So he considered learning by imitation. Look at how children learn. So he said the Turing test is not about can a machine deceive a human. No, it's about imitating the sorts of answers that a human would give to a question. So these are the actual two terms that Turing used in his 1950 seminal paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, satisfactory and sustained. So the Turing test is very relevant today because it's not about deceiving humans. It's can any machine, including Google's new MENA chatbot, can any machine answer any question in a satisfactory manner by imitating the sorts of answers that a human would give? So the Turing described two different tests for his machine thinking exercise, uh, which I um, showed in my PhD through experiments. One is the simultaneous comparison in which uh, a human judge is uh, interacting, questioning two hidden entities at the same time and has to determine which is which. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't touch their entities. It's through text-based question answers only. And the second version, which Turing des described in the latter part of his 1950 paper and went on to elaborate in a 1952 BBC uh, radio discussion was the one-to-one, -one, where the uh, human interrogator now is talking directly with a hidden entity, which could be a human or a machine. So these are detailed in my uh, PhD thesis, uh, which is available at uh, Academia Edu and ResearchGate, uh, the results of uh, these experiments. So I'm now going to um, show you an example of current state-of-the-art machine ability to answer any question in a satisfactory manner. I just have to lower it to raise the voice, uh, the volume, one second. What is the Turing test? The Turing test, developed by Alan Turing in 1950, is a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to, or indistinguishable from, that of a human. Thank you. Hey Google, what is the Turing test? According to Wikipedia, the Turing test, developed by Alan Turing in 1950, is a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to, or indistinguishable from, that of a human. Thank you. Hey Alexa, have you passed the Turing test? I don't need to pass that. I'm not pretending to be human. Great answer. Hey Google, have you passed the Turing test? I don't mind if you can tell I'm not human. As long as I'm helpful, I'm all good. Thank you. Okay, so you can see what the current state of the um, art is. Um, that the machines can answer questions. Uh, they can't answer all questions, but you know, in a hundred years' time, they might be able to. So now there are issues in these nascent AI technologies. So I'm just going to go through some of the issues to bring it back to uh, the title of the topic. One of these is privacy. Now, privacy. There are major data uh, protection concerns in artificial intelligence artifacts and uh, algorithms. So privacy 
um, is a human right and uh, Microsoft CEO actually stated this, that tech companies need to defend privacy as a human right. And it, this is really important in the AI uh, artifacts that they develop. So who are developing these artifacts? So privacy is a fundamental right. It's essential to our autonomy. It's a protection of our human dignity and it serves as the foundation upon which many other human rights are built. Now, this is really crucial because when we look at AI artifacts now and uh, what's going on, who is building them and, uh, and who is being discriminated against them. Now, sharing personal data, I recommend this book by Andreas Weigand, Data for the People, How to Make Our Post-Privacy Economy Work for You. What he's uh, uh, making people realize is and he wrote recommendation systems for Amazon that every day more than a billion people are creating and sharing social data online. Some of the data that we are sharing is knowingly and willingly, and it is part and parcel of the convenience of using the internet and mobile devices. Now, though we are sharing some things knowingly and willingly because it's convenience, a hell of a lot is being harvested unwillingly, unknowingly. Now, I'll give you an example. Now, this is a company online, Lipholz, whom, from whom you can buy luggage. So I bought a laptop bag. Now, I wanted to buy the laptop bag online. When I went online, if you have a look at the screen, it says it makes use of cookies. Before you can even access the site to look at Lipholz laptop bags and other luggage, you get this screen. Now, it's, there's hardly any transparency in, if you look at the statement, what it's saying. There's hardly any transparency there in telling you what data they're collecting and who they're selling your data to. All it says is, yes, I accept, or more information. Now, when you dig deep, obviously, uh, as a researcher and also a teacher to computer science students, I'm not going to click on, yes, I accept. I'm going to dig down to have a look at the privacy policy. When you dig down, where it says more information on the cookie policy. If you look at the cookie policy, um, you might be quite amazed, and I, I'm, I'm sure the experts here who are listening in probably know all this, but if you have a look, this is the kind of data that without transparency, without on the first page being very specific and telling you, this is what they're saying. They say we and our service providers collect personal information in a variety of ways. This is all taken from Lipholz website underneath the more information uh, 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 links. Lipholz defines personal information as information that identifies you as an, as an individual or re relates to an identifiable individual. Now, again, this is not made specific, explicit on the first page of Lipholz website. You have to dig deep to find this. Now, the kind of data that they call personally identifiable identifiable is your name, your gender, your birthday. It also says that it, it identifies you from your postal address. It takes your telephone number, your email address, IP address, credit and debit card number, profile picture, social media account, travel information, including trip flight information. Now, I ask you, the people who have developed this website, why do they need to know the social media account of the consumer, customer, when all they want to do is buy a piece of luggage or a laptop bag? Why do they need the travel information? Do they think the customer is going to buy a laptop or a, a piece of luggage every time they travel? Why do they need to know all this? Now, cookies. They do say about cookies, there are small text files that websites place on your device as you are browsing. They can store a wealth of data enough to potentially ad identify you without your consent. This is not complying with the GDPR, by the way. The primary tool, this is what uh, advertisers use to track your online activity so they can target you with highly specific ads, advertisements. The information that they harvest and collect on you, companies like Lipholz, websites like Lipholz, it is passed to third parties without your knowledge. They ship uh, uh, to affiliates to consult lists, location of affiliates, 
blah, blah, blah. Uh, I will send you these slides afterwards. But the affiliates are used in the document means entities controlled by or under common control with or controlling us. So that means companies that work with Lipolt or that are above working to Lipolt. Those kind of companies are, they, uh, they can include providers of services such as website hosting, data analysis, payment processing, order fulfillment, information technology, related infrastructure provision, customer service, email delivery, auditing, and other services. So in other words, a Lipolt, whom you might want to buy a laptop or a piece of luggage from, has service providers hidden underneath tracking your information, which include providers of other services like website hosting. Third parties are allowed, they are permitted to, to send you marketing communications consistent with your choices made on Lipolt's website. The third parties also offer you sponsors. Uh, they also sponsor sweepstakes, contests, and similar promotion. Now, all I wanted to do was buy a laptop bag. I'm not interested in 30 third party uh, organizations entering me in sweepstakes, contests, blah, blah, blah. So privacy, so that's website. That's just an example of one website, but this is across the internet where it, websites have been taken over by, by ad marketing and organizations like uh, Lipolt, they allow this. Now this also happens in smartphone apps. When you download an, a smartphone app, it is not explicit what hidden trackers are in those apps. So I'll give you an example of one. In the UK, the National Health Service is allowing private companies such as Babylon um, to install an app if you want to download it with, so that you can have conversations with a virtual nurse and a virtual doctor. So this NHS UK app, so this is us UK residents paying tax to enable the NHS free healthcare provider, but private healthcare companies have got apps that come down on your phone, allowing you to speak to virtual doctors and nurses, and they have hidden trackers. The hidden trackers in this one, Babylon's app, includes Facebook login. Now, why does the UK government allow the NHS, the National Health Service, to which taxpayers pay towards, allow it to have an American company Facebook login as a hidden tracker, which is not explicit when you download this NHS app, the Babylon app. Why? Why does it need Facebook login and Google Firebase and Google Crashlytics? Why? So other apps include menstruation data that is being monetized. Out of 36 menstruation tap apps tested by Privacy International, 61% were automatically transferring data to Facebook the moment the female opened the app. This happens whether the user has a Facebook account or not, and whether the uh, female is logged into Facebook account or not. As soon as she opens the menstruation app, it, her usage, her information that she's putting or information uh, she's uh, uh, checking on, tummy ache, tablets, whatever, to control tummy ache, is going to Facebook. Why? Menstruation apps are not concerned with your female health or menstruation cycles. They are turning your periods into money for others. They're collecting information about female health, female sexual life, female mood, and more. Now, this is all contrary to the opt-in consent which has been given in the EU's general data protection regulations. They provide stronger rules for data protection, supposedly to give us individuals more control over our personal data and to give businesses more benefit as a level playing field across companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook. The GDPR consent, it sets a very high standard for consent which is not being complied with. Consent means offering individuals real choice and control, which is not happening in the smartphone app that I gave you an example of, the Babylon NHS app, or the Lipolt uh, website for luggage. 
genuine consent should put individuals in charge. It needs to build trust and engagement and enhance the company, whether it's Babylon app or whether it's uh, uh, Lipolk, enhance their reputation. But unfortunately, convenience is trumping trust. Consent should require positive opt-in, and that is exactly what has been granted in the General Data Protection Regulations. So explicit consent requires very clear and specific statement of consent, which I showed you from Lipolt's website, is not present, and nor was it present in the NHS Babylon Healthcare app. So the Information UK General uh, 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 Data Protections, the UK Information Officer, is investigating the misuse of data also in elections and uh, voting campaigns. And she found a disturbing disregard for voters' personal privacy. So the general data protections do lead to big fines, but a fine of half a million to Facebook is nothing for what they did, passing 87 million users' uh, uh, information, private data to Cambridge Analytica. He, he, these are just some examples of uh, the cesspit of surveillance that is now the web, the uh, World Wide Web. In July, also, the ICO UK Information Commissioner Office announced intent to fine British Airways over 183 million due to infringement of the General Data Protection Regulation for a data breach. So I won't re uh, read all this, but uh, the slides will be given to you uh, and links are there. Um, this also, not just the privacy issue, there's also bias issues. So we'll have a quick look at some of the bias issues now. Um, some algorithms are now tending to discriminate against certain sections of society. And this is why the topic of this to uh, talk is that it, is it because the teams are not diverse or have diverse teams brought in new biases? So this self-fulfilling self prophecy, Amazon's recruitment, it showed that the uh, uh, algorithm was biased against females who are applying for uh, technology jobs at Amazon. So the recruitment model was uh, uh, not very, well, it was discriminating. So Amazon's system taught itself that male candidates were preferable. It penalized resumes, CVs, that included the word women's, as in women's chess club captain, and it downgraded graduates of two all women's colleges. Bias in technologies in the justice system in one area in the US, uh, uh, an algorithm, a piece of software was shown to predict future criminals and it was penalizing black uh, um, people. Um, it was sending them to jail with longer sentences for the same crime committed by white uh, people. So the algorithm, it was no better than random in, in, in how it was deciding who should go to jail for what and for how long. Now we all heard of Google's, Google's uh, biased algorithm where they had to remove their name tagging because when people search for gorillas, Google's uh, algorithm uh, name tagging was bringing up black people. Uh, and then New Zealand's passport renewal system, it kept rejecting the online application of an applicant because the online algorithm kept saying your eyes are not open. I'm sure you've all heard of this one. This was the gentleman who was trying to um, renew their passport online and the online algorithm facial recognition system was saying your eyes are not open. It says the photo you want to upload does not meet the criteria because the subject eyes are closed. So this shows that the big data is actually not big. It's not wide enough. Live facial recognition. So the Met Police over the last uh, uh, six years in the UK has started to trial facial recognition, but the results are really, really poor. There's only been a few handful of arrests based on the live facial rec recognition. And 81% of the so-called suspects that were caught by the cameras were innocent bystanders. They were not on the police watch list. Two of the trials used by the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Police in the UK, which is UK's, one of the UK's largest uh, police uh, organizations, which covers um, the London area, the greater London area, 
the error rate was 100%. So what is the hurry for bringing these systems out? Regardless of these error rates, look at this. So another um, lady, she's given me permission to use her um, images. She tried to upload her um, photograph to apply for an uh, online passport and similar things. The UK's online passport system, just like the New Zealand online passport system, could not uh, authenticate her. In this instance, it was saying, looks like your eyes are closed. We can't find the outline of your head. So this lady on Twitter has given me permission to use these. Um, so this is what she, uh, she was told. It looks like your mouth is open. It looks like your eyes are closed. So this is the recognition system of the UK's online passport system. This is how um, inaccurate it is against people of colour. This um, lady tried several times changing her clothes, but to no avail. Now, in another case, UK's online passport system, a gentleman, as you can see, oh, sorry, yes, he tried, and again, the system failed to recognize him uh, as somebody who has mouth closed. So this is what happened. The UK passport system, we don't understand what the speed is of bringing out these systems when they're not 100% accurate. They knew that their facial recognition recognition system so this is the uk home office they knew that their facial recognition system for the passport renewal was not 100 percent accurate they were aware of the problems but regardless they went ahead to uh, put it in place we don't understand what the speed is why is there a speed now coming back to the uk met police regardless of their trials two of their trials being 100 percent inaccurate they have now rolled out this year uh, live facial recognition cameras across london streets which they say will be used for five to six hours at a time they will let people know in the area when they are going to be used privacy campaigners obviously are up in arms because earlier pilots have shown that they weren't very accurate police say they will warn as i say local communities what is the hurry to get these systems out when they are not accurate. So really the purpose of today was to show that big data that is being used to train algorithms and machines, it, it might be diverse, it might not be diverse. Diversity might bring in, in its own biases, but should we have diverse, more diverse teams to make sure that AI is for the majority of the, the good of the majority. As I said, diversity isn't necessarily the panacea, it could lead to new biases. So I'll just close with last uh, week, there was a new documentary that was uh, presented at the Sundance Film Festival called Coded Bias. In the picture, you can see a lady. She is an MIT AI research scientist. She has to wear a white mask for facial recognition systems to recognize her because the facial recognition system does not recognize does her, the shape of her face, where her face ends and starts, things like that. Okay, so that's really the end of my talk, some references, and uh, thank you very much for your patience and for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Huma. Thank you, this was very interesting. I think we have still a lot of work ahead, <laughs> so. I wish that all the audience members ask questions. So there is a question box on the right side. So feel free. I will start with my questions. And then please ask yours. My question is, how could we increase or how, what could we do to make uh, AI research and develop teams more diverse what is your suggestion recommendation what could we do um okay so um a book i have it here i wanted to show you um this is a book by uh jennifer robertson if you can see it 
Robo Sapiens Japanicus. Yeah. Now, what she, uh, what Jennifer Robertson did was go around uh, robot labs, um, mainly in Japan because they're the most prolific robot builders in the world. And she found that robot labs are populated by male robot developers. And what they're doing is stereotyping the development of robots so that service robots or such as the robot receptionists uh, and robots in, uh, um, say, um, human computer interactions in shopping malls, uh, in Japan lifts, the lift girl, the body is female. So what we're having is males stereotyping some males, not all, obviously all, but stereotyping robots um, to, to have a particular shape to do a particular job. And so what I do as a, a STEM ambassador, I go into schools and primary schools, uh, middle schools, colleges, uh, and I speak to children as young as five, going all up to just before they come to university, as well as obviously teaching in university, is to um, try and encourage, we all need to be part of artificial intelligence and robot development. We need to democratize artificial intelligence and uh, robotic development so that more people are involved, females as well as people from different colors, because we're all using these tools. We're all going to be interacting with robots in shopping malls. For example, when you go to San Jose, uh, California, Silicon Valley, uh, the, the airport San Jose has robots with female body that tell you uh, what shops from which terminal. Uh, Westfield Shopping Center <clears throat> in San Jose, California, Silicon Valley has information robot, security robots. So we need to, so so they're starting to appear in public spaces. So we're going to be interacting with them. We need to be part of developing these, and especially the young. Then it's their future that's going to have more AIs, more algorithms, more robots. They need to be part of development. So how I do it is I just go into schools, give them tablets, and say, do you want to talk to a robot? And get them to talk to uh, chatbots like Cleverbot, Lbot. And the children love it. And it's, it's a way of encouraging them to say, well, look, you can, you can do better than this. You can develop. You know, we need discussions on going into schools. And schools are doing this. I'm fully aware that schools are getting children as young as uh, six, seven, talking about Sophia robot. Should it have citizenship in Saudi Arabia when Saudi Arabia didn't allow women to drive cars at the time when Sophia robot was given um, citizenship? So schools are having these discussions and we need to have more of them. You know, uh, uh, yeah, things like that. Yes, thank you. This is very encouraging. Also that you could go yourself in schools. I think it's great. I have a question from the audience, Ramin. Uh, yeah, okay. two questions. Um, there, I, I read it. The first question is: There are now companies, organizations using technology to audit for bias in AI platforms. What are your thoughts on this? Um, okay, well, al allowing companies to self-regulate -re um, is kind of self-fulfilling. They they could say, "Yeah, we're doing everything we need to do." So. Technologies are always way ahead um, of legislation. So, for example, when I worked on the RoboLaw project, EU FP7 RoboLaw project at Reading University, when it was the early driverless cars and uh, humans for robot, uh, uh, human-robot interactions or personal carer robots, the legislation was way behind mm -hmm. the development so I think this is a discussion that we should have for everybody. Yes, it's good that companies are starting to look at their processes and practices to look at, is there any bias? And yes, we need to have uh, bias training. For example, the first uh, tutorial exercise I give to my students in the artificial intelligence, creativity and ethics class is to look at unconscious bias mm -hmm. and the different biases that we all have, naturally we all have biases, but it's how we manage them. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it is very, yes, it's laudable that companies are looking at the internal processes, but maybe we also need to look at legislation. Is legislation, um, uh, is it appropriate for uh, 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 technologies? 
And it's unfair to say that legislation, it kind of stalls innovation because uh, legislation for, say, cars, automobiles, did not stop innovation in safety in new vehicles. You know, with like the, you know, when I don't drive, but I'm sure people who, who, who drive know about mm -hmm. safety uh, uh, development in cars to improve the safety and security of cars. So innovation does not stall. Um, sorry, legislation does not stall innovation. It can actually help to innovate better, safer, less biased systems. Yes. That's I, what I think. And the second question is, it seems to me, as again, Ramin, it seems to me as if the bias problem in AI is really just an extension of the deeper structural problem of bias and lack of diversity in the tech industry and in society at large. Isn't this the real root cause problem to solve with bias in AI just being another reflection of these problems at the surface? I think it's basically says what you said. Exactly, exactly. And this is why we need to go into schools to get more children. If you look, I'll show you, if you look at the human AI project, I'm going to show you the human AI project. Uh, hang on, sorry, human. Yes, yeah. so if you look at this project, yes. Um, uh, one second. So if you look at people, so this is a, a an EU funded project. Now, if you look at this project, if you scroll down, so this is an EU funded project. Now, thinking about EU funded project, I'm an EU citizen. I pay taxes. Right. But I don't feel represented here. Yes, there are females. I'm very happy there are females in this human AI project. But there's nobody that looks like me. This is the issue. So what your questioner uh, attendee is saying, this is exactly the problem. Look, it's fantastic there's loads of females, but there's nobody in here that looks like me. And I'm a taxpayer and I'm an AI scientist, but there's nobody here that looks like me. So does this mean that we need to have a point system when we're recruiting our, into our research and development teams so that we get development teams that look like the population? Now, we can't do that unless the AI scientists are drawn from the general public so that they look like the the diverse nature of European society. So if you have a look, yes, it, I, I, I'm very happy there's loads of females in this human AI project funded by the EU, but there's nobody that looks like me. In other words, brown skinned. And yet I'm an AI scientist, but how do they know I am an AI scientist? So does that mean they have to spend more time looking for brown skinned, black skinned, AI scientists. I don't know how feasible it is, but it is an AI funded EU, look, EU Horizon 2020 project. But there's nobody in there that looks like me. Okay. So how can they Let's understand my issues? You are now in the project. I mean, you said you're now scientific director of the project. And that I think the key is that whoever starts a new project can put his team together as he, she wants. And I myself, I'm doing research, so it's it's exactly the, you just bring the people together as you think is right. You know? And it's competitive, the calls are competitive, so you basically have to make your team as you think is the best. You know? Exactly, and this is the thing. So when I was creating, so when I was doing the research for this uh, proposal idea, which we were lucky we uh, were successful, I'm looking at uh, obviously strategic partners who can fulfill the tasks that are needed in the project. I wasn't thinking about their color of skin. I was looking at their expertise. And I also did not ask the partners, do you have um, a, a diverse, now, the EU calls themselves are very specific about gender. So when I was recruiting partners, I did m make sure that there was a gender balance in the teams. So we have got partners here who, have, who are led by females, PI. So the, fe the female will be the PI to make sure that we met the, e uh, the call uh, uh, criteria of gender balance. However, I did not think about color of skin because you don't this is the thing when you're preparing grant proposals you're looking at strategic partners who can prove who've got experience in, in in these areas so does that mean that the eu horizon 2020 or horizon calls in the future need to also include more about diversity i think they do i think the eu horizon calls do have diversity because they 
for example, the, this call was the SWAFTS 15. It did have um, addressing UN goals, which incl included inclusivity, which means, I guess, diversity. So I think, yes, maybe we need to think more um, carefully that because we are, uh, for example, what, what, what we're trying to do in this project is build a repository of the kind of websites that people use, the kind of apps that people use. And they could be, for example, uh, male health, uh, they could be child apps engaged at children, you know, are, are directed at children. Also, you know, the, all different things. So we, we, we would be very careful in this, that when we build a knowledge base of the kind of apps and webs, websites that people use, that it does reflect the kinds of people who live in Europe. Yes, and you, of course, also in the user groups, no? when you do your field testing, yeah. on, exactly. you can make exactly. sure you, you have all kind of pop, no? pupils, all kind of people, all kind of citizens. You can no? not just your students, yes. but all kind of people. So I think this is the way to go. I see that the time is running, as always. The cafe goes like too quick. I mean, I could I have about 10 questions more, but OK. So I, for today, I say goodbye. I will now introduce the last, um, the next speaker, not the last, the next speaker um, who is coming. I thank you, Huma. I take over the control. And I thank okay, you thank all you. again for being there. This is great. And I wish that you come next time. I will now take my control. One moment, back to me. And I show the slide of the last. So, so the last slide of the next session and the next session uh, will be on data sovereignty as a key enabler for AI in Europe. The speaker is Sebastian Steinbus, the lead architect of the International Data Space Association, ITSA. Uh, it will be in two weeks, in two weeks on the 19th of February. Please, everybody is invited. I will send you invitations. Also, if you have more questions to Huma, please send it to me or Huma directly. Uh, and also her presentation is available. So if you want to have the presentation or a link to the recording, this is all possible. Just drop a small email and I will answer you. And it was a great pleasure, Huma. And thank I you. Do great things <laughs> with the young people. Thank you very much. And super and continue. <laughs> and thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And thank you to everybody. And have a nice, nice day. So bye bye. And see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye for now.